What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Self Authored. This week, we're addressing a question that was put out by one of our subscribers. His name is Eddie the Average, and here's his question. It was, Self Authored, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the evolution of the human brain. It's pretty common knowledge these days that the evidence points to evolution, not intelligent design. So in what ways do you think we can continue to evolve human intellectualism? Human intelligence has created a physical comfort like heating and transportation. So these are not really physical ways we need to adapt anymore. My question is, in today's society, uh, what are the ways in which you believe we are evolving our intelligences on a macro scale and not an individual basis? Um, now, I'd be arrogant to say I actually had a direct evolutionary question for this one, um, but I do have an answer nonetheless. On a macro scale, I'm going to make the assertion that it's a cultural evolution that happens such that we evolve our intelligences. But as far as how evolution goes, <sighs> What I feel is, for example, the scientific revolution, the whole idea of the way we think scientifically, um, has probably done more for our intellectual evolution than anything else. And you can tell that by the rate at which technology is expanding exponentially and not linearly. Um, but the brain does has evolved, and there's a lot of things that point to that. Um, one of the more popular ones that most people point to, which I'll show a picture of, is how there's the reptilian brain in our, well, they call it that, but it's basically the reptilian part of our brain, the limbic or emotional system, and then the neocortex. And what you're looking at really is on one level, there's the hypothalamus, which is at the pretty much at the root of the reptile brain. And it works together with the pituitary gland to pretty much run your entire hormonal and endocrine system, which is basically what manages everything in your body. So you can kind of see that the limbic system grew out of the reptilian part of the brain, pretty much a more advanced way of regulating um, res emotional responses such that a creature will either act more readily to go for what it needs or to avoid what it needs. And then you can look at the neocortex grew out of that as far as a, a deeper analytic structure. And what I mean by that is it's just like processing. You got basic things that need to be handled, data comes in, and that's handled by the reptilian brain, and then that's sent out for further processing, and then it's sent out for even further processing at the neocortex. It's basically been broken down to segregate all the labor, so to speak, of what data needs to be decoded, what to do with it, what it means, and then that's fed back into the emotional system, which gives you essentially the motivations and incentives for what you should do with that information, and that's fed back into the reptilian brain, which handles it. Um, but pretty much on a level, you're ran by your hypothalamus at the bottom um it pretty much runs the show and everything's just trying to regulate that and so in a complicated way everything in your brain has been managed to uh to outsource labor for the hypothalamus so it knows what to do and, um, another way to look at it is there's two halves of the brain and i talked about this one of my other ones and you got the left brain which is more linear processor style kind of kind of and the right brain is more parallel processor so one's going to be more emotionally rooted looking at patterns and and uh large-scale recognition, whereas the left side of the brain is going to be more looking at uh, straight facts, linear recognition. You're going to get a lot more logical stuff going in there. Um, one way to look at it is order and chaos, but it's a basic idea of the evolution exists in the brain. But what I'm talking about in a response to your question, Eddie the Average, is so much of what's going to happen for us as far as our evolution is going to be on a cultural scale. So we have all this these mechanisms going on in our brain and it's going to be cultural tools that help mediate that make those parts work together better or worse and over time we'll probably see a uh, a biological evolution come out of that but it won't it'll be hundreds of thousands of years before we'll ever see it so I, there's no way we can predict what that would look like but one interesting one is you got to think about it we've been reading for a long time as far as humans right there's been written language we've been reading things for a while although literacy hasn't been popular up until the last couple hundred years but the idea of even say reading in your head is even more recent you know people haven't been reading in their head since until like only the last couple hundred years as literacy has become a main style thing and you can notice in the brain the parts that recognize words and visualize them as well they're they're related to each other in the brain they're literally like touching and so that is in some way kind of a mini evolution that the parts come together and then therefore you can actually read in your head. So what else may come of that as far as other things that we do? Who knows? But when it comes to our cultural evolution, we need to take the way we see imagination and culturally reconstitute that to work better with the scientific 
school of self thought. I really want to point to the idea of how like the scientific revolution has had an example on that. So we get these essentially these tools of thought, scientific method, the way we go about things, the way research is checked and balanced with each other, such that it actually creates results. And we know this based on technology. So this worked out. It, t- it passed the test. Um, but all it was was a cultural tool. It wasn't anything biological. It wasn't anything in the brain. It was a cultural structure imposed upon the way we think that actually worked out. And most things are like that. And so what I'm going to say is it's actually we're about due for another one of those. So the cultural revolution I'm calling for is that it's a necessity for imagination in a scientific future. Science alone isn't going to create the future for us. It's the fact that we can imagine a better future and then use science to help articulate it and manifest it in this world. If you think about it, all science really is, is the ability to use logic and the laws of physics and basically manifest ideas that come into your imagination into the real world. And in another awesome quote from Terence McKenna that kind of supports us where he says, you know, Reality is just the condensation of the imagination. It's that which, seep, that which seeps through. Now, the imagination is basically the, your ability to relate completely unrelated ideas and topics and throw them all together in a world that has no fucking rules, right? It's like this little heavenly space inside your head that, that all, everything goes. And then you use science as this way of going, well, how, what are the rules and constraints of the world we're working in? And then how can I best manifest that idea into the real world and that's hard to do you can literally say that's what being creative is creative is that you take something in your imagination and you create it in the real world and that's a real skill and so what i'm calling for is a as a recognition of imagination as something useful and it, it generally is but it's not acted out that way so to set this up let's get a layout of what i mean by science how that acts acted out culturally and what we do with that. So what I'm talking about is if you look at the way science is and the way the knowledge that we bring forth, all the logic, information, knowledge, the entire epistemolo- epistem- uh, epistemology, basically knowledge foundations of our culture and our entire society, those are inherited. You don't come into this world knowing those. You come in this world with a brain that you've essentially got to figure out how to use but you inherit your entire cultural set of knowledge. And then science is basically all that knowledge articulated up until this point, what we got. But the interesting thing about it is, is when you act out your imagination, you know this was kids. They're very imaginative. They come up with stuff. It's very explorative. And there was a philosopher, his name was uh, Spinoza. And he made the very keen insight to notice that. He says, people are imaginative beings not rational beings. And what he means by that is that we see X infers Y and we imagine why that is. We imagine why one thing causes another to happen. And it's only through further investigation and I would say only through basically a more rigorous applying of of scientific principles that we therefore actually figure out the real reasons why. And you can tell this because throughout cultural history, go back to anything mythological. You, they see what happens and you go, oh, this is what it must be. The best example is going to the idea of the stars. Back then, people would look up and they'd go, it's the ancestors. They're the ancestors and the light's far off. Now, that's kind of a wacky idea if you look at it on the surface. It doesn't really relate, but it kind of explains it. Think about it. Light from the stars is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old by the time it reach us, reaches us. It is the ancestors, what we're seeing is the ancestors of what used to be. It's not really always what's up there. A lot of the stars might be gone by now. We're seeing light that's millions of years old. We're not even seeing what's really there. So it's this idea that we imagine possible futures and possible ideas, and then we act them out until we can figure out what it really is. And science is essentially a speeding up of that process. Because if you think about it, we've been acting out a lot of things for thousands of years, and progress is generally pretty slow. A lot of people got to die trying to act it out against each other, and different ideas got to battle it out, out in the in the world against each other. And it's a generally expensive and timely process. So the science speeds all that up. Because with science, your ideas can die instead of you in trying to explore that. 
But in taking on this idea that your ideas can die and you should test everything rigorously in a lab, we kind of kill that explorative nature within children. And we kill it within ourselves. And I'm not saying this, that we should go out there and shame parents and shame ourselves and be guilty about everything. No, but it's just being aware of it. Neil deGrasse Tyson explains this best. He has this story where he talks about children banging on things, hitting on pots and pans, knocking things over, doing all this. They're essentially creating little science experiments to figure out what's going on in the world. How's it working? And, you know, anybody who's a parent will know that shit's frustrating. They knock things over and they cause messes in this and you're just trying to like keep order at bay. But in all actuality, kind of the best way of parenting is kind of have a constrained area where they can have their little hellish chaos and discover the world. That's what playpens are. And that's what, where you have your room or your space or your play area to just go all out and figure things out. And that's good and healthy for them. But we also get why that's dangerous. You know, curiosity unchecked, basically, if you don't have any sort of rules of safe exploration, it's dangerous. Look at little kids. They try to cross the street and do everything. They don't have any sense of how to safely explore their world. And it seems like parenting is that balance of teaching them how to safely explore the world while retaining the want to explore the world. And so that's where I'm going with this is there's a lot of good to be have with imagination and what it generates for you. Every time you have a goal, every time you have a dream, every time you have an idea of something you'd like to be or do or create in the world, that's your imagination. Now, actually creating that in the world and going for it is you enacting it. And that takes an act of courage. And generally what you notice in the world is to explore in the world is left to, it's... It's scared out of a lot of us because of all the dangers that are in the world and everything's going on such that we're not taught how to safely explore and use tools to figure out how to learn more about the world and how to practice creating in the world. But we're kind of scared into actually taking much more than a step outside of our house. So people don't really go for big goals. They don't go for big dreams. They don't try to come up with creative ideas. And also you're afraid to share an idea and be told that's stupid. So essentially being a creative and imaginative person that's actually going for it in the world is left to only the most courageous or pathological of us in the world. Hence why you see super successful people who are like damn near fearless or ridiculous or psychopathic. You know, you leave it up to that. And furthermore, if you leave the imagination to not be explored or understood by the individual, because the imagination could have dark places, but kind of the beauty of it is That's why I say we need to learn how to safely explore it. It's keeping all that locked into the imaginative world such that you don't manifest it. Because if you notice, if if it's pretty much people are most imaginative when they're most emotionally vulnerable. Think about revenge. People got lots of great imaginative ideas when they're wanting revenge. When people want to seek wrath upon each other, punishment. Look at all the thousands of ways we have to torture each other. Those took imagination, some of those machines, if you haven't looked at them. Google torture devices, and you'll see stuff that you know took thought to come up with. And just the way we try to get revenge on each other. Like, revenge just seems to be such a big one. And one more I almost forgot is, think of it in times of war is when we're most imaginative. All the greatest technologies, all the most, we, we advance faster and in the most dangerous ways during times of war. And in fact, if you think we can tap into that level of imagination and urgency in times that we're not at war, we might actually create some good stuff. So I guess I'm struggling to articulate this clearly, but what I'm noticing is that scientific thought is extremely powerful, but has kind of created a a void in the world where we kind of have beaten down on the imaginative nature. And I noticed you mentioned intelligent design, which is kind of a dig at religion. But if you look at it, religion is kind of like the imagined trying to figure out morality as coming out of like, well, we're all working together. What's this going on? Where does it come from? Why do we all have equal value? Or maybe it's from this transcendent thing. And you're, it's kind of a working, working out the imagination. And obviously you can say it was very imaginative based off all, all the stories and everything that came out of it. But we've transcended that and now gone into this very logical thinking space, or at least believed we are. And mind you, it's only 400 years old that we've been practicing this, so it's still relatively new. Um, and we've driven all the imaginative side kind of into the unconscious and, and kind of left a void there. And so what I'm saying is let's kind of revive that 
and come up with ways in which we can learn to safely explore the imagination, both the good and dark sides of it, and find out ways to practice creating that in the world. And that's the macro scale of it. But as I want to take it back to the micro, it has it, how it has to do with you and me and everybody on an individual basis. It's practicing making goals. I'd like to be able to see that we can be willing to imagine goals and practice creating them in the world. Too often we'll come up with an idea and be very quick to rationalize logically all the reasons why it won't work. But that's really kind of a shitty use of imagination because you can just as creatively imagine the other direction of all the positive things that may happen or even all the ways in which it might work. But that's also going to take work from you, which is usually why it's so hard to go that direction. The other direction is easy. You can just quit. But it's also when people have ideas. It's one thing to go, oh, that's stupid. That doesn't exist. Half of things in science didn't exist 10 years ago. I mean, the favorite one everyone has is the iPod. And although that's no longer 10 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago at this point now. But it's this idea that, that it, instead of shaming somebody by saying that's stupid, that doesn't exist, the better question to ask is, oh, that's interesting. What would it take for that to exist? Because then you're playing on the imagination and you're instilling a sense of wonder and curiosity such that people are willing to learn and go out there. And you might even be able to say the fact that we shame new ideas like that has created kind of like the ideological madness we have in politics. Maybe, maybe not. I'm just throwing out ideas. But I think that's where we can start is in your own life, practice coming up with goals and figuring out ways in which it'll actually work and going for it and taking steps towards it. Come up with ideas when you're in an argument how to resolve it, not make it worse, and not how to just continually judge the other person. Practice using your imagination in good ways. Um, Terrence McKenna has a favorite, a quote of mine that I like, where he says, worry is a waste of imagination. Because think about it, when you're worried or anxious, all you're doing is imagining possible futures that could screw you over that are bad for you. When you can actually, just as easily, if you wanted to, imagine possible futures that are good for you. So, Back to the religious argument, um, because it is a curious one, since you did mention intelligent design. And there's multiple ways of looking at this, and I'm not calling for a personified deity, but I am calling kind of like an idea of the divine, transcendent type of stuff. In a sense that if you think about it, the world may not be intelligently designed by a single being, but it is intelligently designed by the multiple interactions of thousands of beings, which is evolution. And the world we live in may not be necessarily intelligently designed, but it is intelligently designed by the creative imaginations of mankind. I mean, we've essentially started designing things to make the world work a little bit better, try to help the ecosystem by putting fake aqueducts, putting fake dams and all this stuff to try to make things better. We're actually beginning to intelligently design the world, more or less to correct our own shit, but it's still not much different. So there was kind of a a wacky dude named William Blake, who pretty much was a Gnostic thinker, basically meaning he believed that he knew that there was a, a deity and a god, and but he wasn't really into religion that much. He kind of was, but he wasn't really into the more Christianic religion. But he had the theory that the idea of God was the imagination, and it was completely rooted in the concept that we're, it's the one place we all have access to that fits with God. It has no rules and all that stuff, and you can kind of do whatever you want in the imagination. It's kind of like heaven is basically the the symbolism he was pointing to. And it's the one thing we all have access to. And interestingly enough, more often than not, when we manifest things out of the imagination into the world, um, it generally brings us closer together. And I know I mentioned earlier about all the stuff that we do come out of it, that's evil and war and stuff like that, and the ills we do upon each other. But every bit of technology, your bed, what I'm talking to you guys on, a pencil, most everything that comes out of it that's created is essentially used to bring us closer together. So in a way, it's uniting us under a transcendent idea of manifestations of the imagination. So I don't say that to make necessarily an argument for, for intelligent design, but more as a, a call to have you hear out those arguments and look for other ways and imagine other ways in which they might be useful for you. So I hope you take what I talked about today. Um, found out that if you haven't, didn't know already, and you can look it up some more on your own, that there is a lot of proof for evolution within the brain, um, although we have no clue where that's going. Um, the importance of what science has brought for us, as well as 
the hole that it's created with the imagination in our world and that I, I really have a call for you to tap into that and help others into that as well, such that we can imagine and create better futures for each other. Um, thank you for watching. If you liked the video, hit the like button. If you like what I do here, um, hit the subscribe button. I'll be making another video here soon. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.